is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Allegri. Uh, she is a professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. She did her MD in Belgium and then her PhD at the University of Chicago. She's quite an active researcher as well as member of the American Society of Transplantation. I had the pleasure of uh, sharing committees and, and working with her and she's inspiring. She has so much energy and also her science is amazing and we really are excited to have her here today. She, uh, her research is focused on T cell responses in the transplant setting, going from uh, mechanisms of tolerance to effects of infection in transplant tolerance and lately into the influence of microbiota in transplant outcomes. And we're really excited uh, to, to have this talk to our trainees and, and welcome uh, Maurice and thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks, Leo. Uh, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to give a virtual talk like this. Um, yeah, so Leo and Sandro asked me to talk about T cell mechanism, mechanisms of acute rejection. And so I thought I would start by putting things uh, a little bit in the context of rejection just temporarily, um, just to remind you that um, uh, there are three kind of classifications of rejection um, based on how quickly they happen after transplantation and also based on the mechanism of rejection. Um, one is hyperacute rejection that's uh, due to preformed antibodies and that happens very, very quickly after transplantation um, and results in thrombosis of blood vessels and necrosis of the graft. The second one is acute rejection, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And this one is absolutely T cell dependent, can happen weeks to months after transplantation. Um, and, um, you know, in animal models, if you deplete T cells, this doesn't happen. Um, and then chronic rejection that takes a longer time to happen that can be uh, T cell mediated, maybe antibody mediated. Um, it's a little bit less understood, um, but there are clear signs of graft pathology with uh, um, vascular fibrosis um, and reduced graft function. So we're going to focus here on acute rejection, and I've told you that it's T cell mediated. Um, and before um, uh, T cells are activated, T cells need to be activated by antigen presenting cells that present a peptide in the context of their major histocompatibility complex. So before this can happen, uh, a key player here is the antigen presenting cell. Um, and um, before transplantation, um, you know, there's a growing um, literature out there that's showing that antigen presenting cells are poised or licensed by the microbiota. So we, um, for example, have done experiments, skin transplantation experiments in germ-free mice, uh, in animals that don't have any microbes anywhere in their body, and we can see that their antigen presenting cells are less able to activate T cells. Um, and if you reconstitute those mice with microbiota, now the antigen presenting cells can present um, antigen much better to T cells. So you have to think about the host of the transplant and the donor of the transplant. Both are going to have their microbiota, not only in the gut, but also uh, in the organ, if it's an organ that's colonized, that is being transplanted, like the intestinal or the lung. And so you have to be thinking about the antigen presenting cells from the donor and from the recipient that before transplantation already are um, licensed and poised more or less, um, depending on the microbiota that they have. So this is before transplantation. At transplantation, still thinking of the antigen presenting cells, there's, um, this is uh, quite new literature from the groups of Fadilakis and uh, Sean Lee, who have shown that there is a mechanism of non-self recognition um, between post APCs and donor APCs by different types of receptors. So when you put a transplant in 
that carries some donor antigen presenting cells and some donor parenchymal cells that um, have um, polymorphisms in some of their um, surface markers. They have different MHC molecules. And so these host antigen presenting cells have both receptors that can recognize um, allogeneic MHC and receptors that can recognize polymorphisms on non-MHC molecules that can make them a little bit activated and capable of producing the cytokine interleukin-12, which is going to be very important for um, priming uh, T cells and leading them down a differentiation towards the TH1 phenotype. So non-self-recognition. And then finally, after transplantation, um, there's this other uh, third concept uh, emerging in the literature that you not only have antigen presenting cells that can pick up dead cells, process and present the antigens, but you also have donor cells that are secreting microvesicles, including exosomes. And these exosomes can decorate the surface of antigen presenting cells with donor molecules, and in particular with donor MHC molecules. Uh, and this may play a very important role in activation of T cells that can recognize donor MHC molecules directly, uh, but here presented or, or positioned on the surface of host and even presenting cells. So these are kind of the things that um, you know, we need to be cognizant of that happen uh, on antigen presenting cells. So then the antigen presenting cell is going to present a peptide to a T cell. And this is how um, the initiation of transplantation is going to, to start. Each T cell is going to have a different T cell receptor uh, on their surface. And you're going to have T cells that by chance directly recognize donor MHC molecules with a self-donor peptide presented on their surface uh, on donor antigen presenting cells or donor parenchymal cells. So this type of presentation is called direct presentation because it doesn't require processing. You have a subset of T cells with a T cell receptor that by chance will recognize this foreign MHC molecule. Then you have indirect presentation. So this depends on donor cells that um, are dying, let's say, and that are phagocytosed by host antigen presenting cells, maybe macrophages or dendritic cells. And then the, the proteins that are on the donor cell are processed into little peptides that are then um, displayed on the surface of host now MHC molecule. Um, and these peptides, if um, they have uh, polymorphisms between the donor and the recipient, so they look a little bit different, um, they, they will be able to recognize by a small subset of T cells that can recognize that difference um, in the protein. And of course, one of the most polymorphic molecules is the MHC itself, so it could be MHC molecules from the donor that are processed and presenting presented a little peptide of the donor MHC molecule presented in the context of self MHC to an indirect recipient T cell. And then the third mechanism is what uh, is now called semi-direct presentation, which I alluded to in the, in the slide before, which is the ability of donor antigen presenting cells and perhaps donor parenchymal cells to shed microvesicles, uh, including exosomes, with intact donor MHC molecule uh, on the surface of these exosomes. These exosomes can fuse with the host antigen presenting cell and now display intact MHC molecules so that now this antigen presenting cell will be able to activate a directly recognizing T cell um, but also, if it's processed and presented don donor antigens on self-MHC, on host-MHC molecules, it will also be able to activate at the same time an indirectly recognizing T cell. And maybe the directly recognizing T cell, if it's a CD4 positive T cells, for example, 
can help this indirectly recognizing T cell that's a CD8 uh, positive T cell. So, um, so this is another mechanism by which you could have direct recognition of intact donor MHC, but on both antigen presenting cells. So then where does this happen? This happens in the secondary lymphoid organs that drain the transplanted organ. So here is an example of a skin graft where things will be drained to um, draining lymph nodes of the skin. If it's a, a vascularized organ, things normally drain to the spleen as a secondary lymphoid organ because the, the lymphatics are cut in the organ that's transplanted. Um, and so you will have donor antigen presenting cells, recipient antigen presenting cells, capturing, um, processing and presenting donor antigens that are migrating to these secondary lymphoid organs and then activating T cells that will then proliferate, differentiate into effector cells, migrate out um, and circulate, find the graft and then destroy the graft. And so, you know, how is this graph destroyed? And I think, you know, it's pretty much still incompletely understood. Um, there are some things that have been tested and, and models that are out there for how this destruction happens, but it's not um, fully, fully firm. So one hypothesis, especially for CD8 positive T cells, is that the recytotoxicity and killing of um, graft cells, antigen presenting cells or parenchymal cells or endothelial cells via these potential mechanisms, fast perforin trail production of TNF that can be cytotoxic. And then another um, mechanism that's out there is that there is inflammation when you have uh, a graft and you have recruitment of immune cells that can produce inflammatory cytokines. Um, and some of these cytokines are damaging to the graft. Um, for example, interferon gamma is um, an excellent cytokine to induce upregulation of MHC molecules. Um, and so if you have host immune cells that are infiltrating the graft and they are producing interferon gamma, this will enhance the expression of, into, of uh, MHC on graft cells and therefore make graft cells more able to be recognized by direct T cells and more able to be killed than by direct T cells. Um, but these uh, immune cells are also going to produce chemokines and other soluble factors that can attract other um, adaptive and innate cells um, that may be able to participate in the rejection process. And um, that is going to change uh, to be different depending on the type of T cell differentiation that um, uh, has happened uh, in the context of priming of T cells after transplantation. Um, and so I imagine that um, you've all gone through the differentiation of naive T cells, but depending on the cytokines that surrounds a naive T cell when um, it is activated, um, when it recognizes antigen on an antigen presenting cell, it can become a Th1, a Th2, a Th17 cell, a Treg. And the characteristic of these cells is that they have a unique profile of cytokines. Th1 cells secrete interferon gamma, Th17 cells secrete IL-17, Th2 cells secrete um, IL-4 and IL-5. And these cytokines can attract and activate innate immune cells. Interferon gamma can activate macrophages, IL-17 can attract neutrophils, IL-5 attracts eosinophils. Um, and so there are uh, models out there and in, in, uh, papers out there that show that um, these innate immune cells um, can participate in rejection, can mediate rejection. Um, often, you know, it's Th1 that's most commonly associated with rejection, um, but these other cell types can definitely drive rejection um, and you can find these um, 
um, at, uh, innate cells that are infiltrating the graft and that seem to participate in the rejection. Okay, so then um, if we step back a little bit and you really think about what's going on um, when a T cell is activated and then has to go back to the graft and what it recognizes in the secondary lymphoid organs, lymph nodes or spleen, and then what it has to recognize in the graft to mediate rejection, um, it may help you conceptualize a little bit what has to happen for the graft to be rejected. So if we're talking about CDA positive T cells first, um, you may have a directly recognizing CD8 with the black T cell receptor here that recognizes donor MHC and self peptide in the secondary lymphoid organs. So it's becoming activated and then it's going to go to the graft. And this is the easiest situation because the graft, all graft cells are going to express donor MHC class one. And so this T cell is going to be able to recognize and get the second hit from any graft cell. And then if it's a cytotoxic CD8, we'll be able to kill that graft cell. Um, and um, you can have donor MHC class one that's expressed on all graft cells. Uh, and you know, with this semi-direct presentation that we've seen, also on host APCs if there are donor exosomes that are shed. But so this is the easiest um, possibility. And the mechanism of graft damage in this case is um, direct cytotoxicity and perhaps also secretion of um, inflammatory cytokines that can damage the graft. The second possibility is that the T cell that recognizes the allopeptide is an indirect T cell. So this cell is going to go to the graft, but it's not going to be able to interact with the green graft cell directly because its T cell receptor only recognizes the allopeptide and not the donor, intact donor MHC. And so how could this lead to graft rejection? And so it's not entirely clear um, how this happens. Um, it may be that you have activation of host antigen presenting cells and production of cytokines that can damage the graft. Um, it may be that there are some host endothelial cells that can process and present the peptide and so you can damage some host vasculature leading to the graft. Um, but um, this is not completely understood. Um, so, you know, perhaps um, innate immune cells and, and inflammatory cytokines. Now, if we look at CD4 positive cells, it's even more complicated. <laughs> uh, so you can have direct CD4 positive cells with a black TCR that recognize donor um, cells, donor antigen presenting cells in the lymph node the spleen. This is activated. It goes back to the graft and so in the beginning, you will have MHC class two that is expressed on donor antigen presenting cells, but these cells are short lived uh, and they will disappear over the days and weeks after transplantation. Um, endothelial cells uh, also express MHC molecules, so donor endothelial cells could be a good target as well. Um, but as the ischemia or perfusion injury, the inflammation winds down, the donor MHC class two is also uh, reduced. And so in the beginning, direct CD4 positive T cells can damage the graft, but over time, this uh, recognition is going to disappear or at least be greatly reduced. And then how do CD4 cells kill the graft? We normally think of CD8 positive cells as being cytotoxic. Some CD4s have been shown to be cytotoxic. Um, you could all also imagine that they produce interferon gamma and induce upregulation of MHC class one on graft cells and they're therefore prime the graft for cytotoxicity by CD8s. Um, and then also this indirect pathway of damaging cytokines or activation of innate cells. The Indirect recognition pathway here, the CD4 positive cell recognizes a donor peptide on host MHC. Um, this is actually 
the way that alloantibodies are generated because alloantibodies, of course, are produced by host B cells. Um, and so host B cells to be able to present to um, allopeptide to T cells are going to have to um, do this by the indirect route. And so when these indirect T cells go to the graft, um, they are not going to be recognizing anything. So they will need recipient antigen presenting cells to express host image C class 2 and to infiltrate the graft. Um, and, and therefore the, the rejection has to be indirect, presumably by production of cytokines that can damage the graft um, and um, production of cytokines that can upregulate MHC on the graft and um, um, poise the graft for rejection by direct T cells. So, um, you know, it ends up being a little bit complicated if you think about the fine details of what does each T cell recognize when it goes back to the graft. Uh, Marisa? Uh, yes. Uh, this is uh, Gilles Milichou. Uh, I Hi, just wanted to, uh, how are you doing? Just wanted to add two things uh, to what you said. Now, I think it's a very good uh, overview of this recognition. And, uh, I, I think that this applies mostly for naive T cells. Or, and uh, if they are pre-existing memory cells, I, I believe they can be uh, activated directly in the graft. That's right. And so uh, at the end of the talk, I'll talk about uh, memory okay. cells. Thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, wanted, I'm sorry. The, the other thing I wanted to point out. Um, yes. Uh, for the, first for of all, the, the yeah, absolutely. For, yeah. for the rejection by T cells, uh, two things. One, I'm personally not convinced uh, that the grafts are actually rejected by T cells. Uh, that for, and I think it, it's not been really demonstrated. The, the second thing is that uh, you have to come at CD4 cells and indirect pathway, and how can it uh, uh, lead to rejection? And I think that uh, after allo recognition, there's a lot of autoimmunity uh, which takes place in, in the graft. Uh, uh, that might be a way uh, for the graph to be rejected. It, it might yes. end up. It that will be my last slide. A, uh, ah, okay. Your All right. ah. Yes. <laughs> Thank excellent. you Thank for you. Uh, laying out the, the whole presentation. <laughs> sorry for sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. It's great. Uh, these are great points. Thanks for making them. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, so here's the vis visualization again uh, in the secondary lymphoid organs. Uh, Gilles is correct. So we're talking about naive T cells and how they are activated in secondary lymphoid organs. Go to the graph. This is the blood vessel. Um, so uh, you will be able to have some direct recognition of endothelial cells here, and then both direct uh, and indirect recognition in the graft. But then, um, you know, not exactly clear like Gilles said, um, whether the graph is really rejected because of the direct cytotoxic effect of the T cells or indirect inflammatory cytokines and so on. Okay, so then, um, you know, just a little bit of uh, primary literature so that you guys have it on how were some of these concepts tested experimentally. Um, in terms of what do alloreactive T cell subsets recognize in the graph? Is it donor MHC? Is it recipient MHC? Is it donor antigen presenting cells, parenchymal cells? Um, and so these are um, old experiments now um, done. Um, I don't know if other people did them as well, but uh, uh, Ron Gill was uh, one of the people who really addressed these points. Um, and he was trying to understand how CD4 positive T cells can mediate cardiac allograft rejection. Um, and he used a, a mouse model um, to do this and transferred CD4 positive T cells into mice that did not have T cells. So the only rejection could happen from these transferred cells. And then he used grafts that lacked MHC class 2 of recipients that lacked both T cells and MHC class two. And he could see that the CD4 positive T cells that he had transferred um, were capable of rejecting 
um, the graphs if the host did not have class two, but were not capable of rejecting a, a graph that was MHC class two deficient. And so he concluded that um, donor, but not host MHC class two um, is necessary for, for graph rejection um, by direct, presumably by direct uh, recognition of CD4 positive cells. So donor MHC class two is important. So the CD4 positive cells definitely go to the graph and recognize some donor MHC class two. And in the absence of CD8 positive cells, <coughs> they are sufficient to mediate rejection, even though you know most of them are not going to be cytotoxic. Um, and, but then, you know, perhaps via activation of antigen presenting cells. And then the same group with Ron Gill, they ask whether um, what what cell were the CD4 T cells recognizing in the graft? Were they recognizing donor antigen presenting cells or parenchymal cells that happen to express MHC class two? And so he did um, experiments modifying the donor graft before transplantation so that either the donor APCs or um, hematopoietic cells lack MHC class two, or the donor radioresistant parenchymal cells lack MHC class two. Um, and he was able to show that um, donor parenchymal cells, including endothelial cells, were not sufficient to initiate rejection, um, but, but they were um, targets of uh, other recognition. Let me just move this because I... There we go. Um, so um, the, the CD4 T cells could recognize um, parenchymal cells, um, but that was not necessary to, uh, to start rejection. Um, and then for CD8 positive cells, this was a study by Dan Kreisel um, in Bruce Rosengart's lab, um, showing that the CD8 positive T cells of direct specificity could recognize presumably donor endothelial cells and did not need to recognize hematopoietic professional antigen presenting cells necessarily. Um, so if MHC class one was expressed on donor endothelial cells, that could enable the CD8 positive cells to um, drive rejection. So just some papers so that you have it. So in terms of the effector mechanism of rejection, this is again studies by Von Gill to show this is in a mouse model of islet transplantation. Um, and he uh, used CD8 positive T cells that were either deficient in perforin, um, which is a molecule that's important for cytotoxicity, um, and deficient in fast ligand, which would engage FAS on the islets uh, and induce apoptosis of the islets. So two different mechanisms of killing and cytotoxicity by CD8 positive T cells. Um, and sh he showed that individual disruption of perforin or fast ligand on T cells, on CD8 positive T cells, we didn't do very much. But if he eliminated both perforin and fast ligand on these T, T cells, that prevented rejection in most of the recipients. Um, so cytotoxicity by CD8 positive cells uh, seems to play a role in graft rejection, at least for islet transplantation. And then interferon gamma, production by CD8 positive T cells also seems important for rejection of islet allografts. Um, and I have a figure, I think, for that here, where um, um, the, the investigators transferred CD8 positive T cells that were either perforin deficient or deficient in um, fast ligand or deficient in interferon gamma. Um, and you can see, so these were islet transplantation to mice that I think were lymphopenic. So if you don't transfer CD8 positive T cells, you don't get rejection of these islets. If you transfer wild type T cells, you get rejection of these islets very rapidly. If they are individually deficient in perforin or fast ligand, as before uh, in, in the paper that I mentioned before, the graphs can be rejected. 
but if the CD8 positive T cells are deficient in interferon gamma, the graphs cannot be rejected. Um, and you know, it's thought that the interferon gamma made by the T cells is helping graft cells upregulate MHC class one so that now they can be recognized more effectively and killed more effectively. Um, so we talked about TH17 cells being able to mediate rejection. Um, and there's more evidence of that now, uh, and perhaps more evidence after um, lung transplantation. Uh, but these were the first experiments that were performed by um, Javid Ansari, who's uh, at Northwestern now, um, and who showed that um, in mice that were deficient in their ability to differentiate each one positive cell, so they couldn't have this interferon gamma mediated pathway of rejection, IL-17 cells were able to mediate rejection. Um, and then um, work from my lab uh, in a slightly different model where we were trying to induce transplantation tolerance to heart allografts by giving co-stimulation blockade type of, of regimens. Um, and then we were trying to prevent tolerance induction, asking whether uh, infectious, infections or microbial agents could prevent the induction of transplantation tolerance. We could prevent transplantation tolerance with um, agonists of toll-like receptors, such as endotoxin or CPG or um, other um, molecules that one can find in um, various uh, pathogens. And we showed that that uh, rejection and, <coughs> excuse me, prevention of transplantation tolerance by toll-like receptor agonists was dependent on IL-17 and IL-6. Um, and this is this data that um, if um, you induce transplantation tolerance uh, to heart allografts, these hearts are accepted um, long-term forever and we have development of donor-specific tolerance. Um, if we uh, inject CPG, which is a toll-like uh, receptor 9 agonist. Now, this regimen cannot induce tolerance and all the graphs are rejected. But if you inject the CPG and at the same time block IL-17 and IL-6, now these graphs are not rejected. So in this circumstance, where it's a little bit different, where it's a, a model of tolerance that cannot be achieved because of encountering microbial molecules, this rejection seems to be TH17 dependent. Okay, so then um, you have. Uh, so Mar Marisa, yes. in, in going back to this slide now. Yes. Uh, so the in, in the in inducing an innate uh, immune response prevents torrent induction. Uh, yes. Can, can you break already uh, ongoing? Torrent? Yeah. So that's an interesting question. So. Um, no, we have tried very hard breaking tolerance. So injecting uh, here uh, at day 30 or day, day 60 after transplantation of tolerance. Um, okay. We have injected combinations of CPG, LPS, and PAM3-CIS, so agonists of TLR9, TLR4, and TLR2. And at doses that are half lethal, meaning that if we just double the doses, all the mice die, so we can't go any, any um, higher in the dose, um, we cannot break this transplantation tolerance once it is established. Um, however, we can break transplantation tolerance if we infect the mice with Listeria monocytogenes, um, but not with other um, bacteria that we have tried. So we can infect the mice at day 60 or so with Listeria, and that will precipitate rejection in about a week or, or 10 days, something very quickly. And in that setting, um, you know, which is you know, clearly a pathogen with a bunch of uh, microbial um, um, patterns mm -hmm. uh, and molecules expressed, in that setting, the rejection is dependent on the combination of type 1 interferon and interleukin-6. And we can um, see the same precipitation of rejection without the pathogen if we just inject high doses of type 1 interferon and IL-6. And so, you know, my 
thinking is that if you have infections that elicit those two um, groups of cytokines, um, or perhaps a, a viral infection that induces type 1 interferon production and a bacterial superinfection that induces production of IL-6, that that would be um, damaging for the graft. Um, and so we're very interested in, um, you know, the, what maintains transplantation tolerance and what are the, the challenges, infectious or otherwise, that um, can break established transplantation tolerance. Marisa, uh, it's Agnes. Uh, hello. Yes. <laughs> Good to hear you. Um, on, the, on the same line, uh, uh, did you try to vaccinate those mice to administer vaccines that would have strong adjuvants and uh, to see if it would break tolerance or prevent? Um, like flu vaccine? With, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. No, so we've never, never done that. Um, People have been looking at that, right, in patients to see if vaccination was safe, if it could prevent, if it could trigger rejection. Yes, because um, there, uh, there is some concern out there that uh, some adjuvants might trigger rejection. Yeah, so we haven't found, at least for the Tolec receptor agonists, we haven't found a combination that could uh, trigger rejection. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that should be a little bit reassuring. Uh, it's actually quite hard to break tolerance once it's uh, established. Of course, patients are rarely tolerant, right? They're yeah. uh, immunosuppressed. But uh, I would say that, you know, with immunosuppression on board, um, if, if vaccines with strong adjuvants can trigger rejection, my hunch is they would be controlled relatively easily. Um, but yeah, perhaps, yeah, we've never tried it in our animal models. Yeah, thank Marisa, you. I promise the last question on this. Oh, no, no, <laughs> um, go ahead. So uh, I, I, it, it's interesting that CPG obviously is total, uh, total receptor 9, and that's usually found in plasmacytoid dendritic cells. Have you ever taken the PDCs and treated them in vitro with CPG, and then adoptively transferred them after they established tolerant in order to see if you could override that? No, we haven't done that. Um, we, the, the closest to that, I mean, it's not really close to that, um, when, so we had this question of why is it that some tissues are more immunogenic than others, um, and why is skin rejected so strongly when, um, you know, um, kidney or, uh, or heart are not rejected as much. Um, and there we were thinking a lot about antigen presenting cells and the different composition of antigen presenting cells in the different tissues. And there we could show that if we transplant the heart and we give at the same time uh, Langeron cells or you know, cells isolated from the skin, um, we could prevent the induction of transplantation tolerance. Um, so I don't know if um, plasma cytoidendritic cells activated in vitro would do the same thing. I would suspect that they would because you would activate them just like, you know, the Langeron cells that we were isolating from the skin would be activated by the process of isolation and so on. So I would suspect that that would work. Yeah. Um, of course, now with, you know, I think the, the difference in composition, the difference in, in types of antigen presenting cells is really important, but now um, we're thinking more along the lines of uh, the microbiota, uh, which is present in the skin, but not in the, in the heart, um, and what role that plays. Thank you. And, and that also plays a role. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. So then, um, then you have a, a picture like this, where you have a naive T cell that is activated. And then we haven't talked about that antibody just to tell you that the indirect pathway of presentation is what's important for antibody production. Um, but then if you have a T cell, CD4 T cell that interacts with a host B cell that has processed allo, uh, antigen and is presenting allopeptide, this T cell is going to become a T follicular helper cell. The B cell is going to become activated um, to produce um, alloreactive antibodies um, and perhaps become plasma cells in the bone marrow that uh, produce donor-specific antibodies. 
Um, and so this can contribute um, to the chronic rejection pathology. Um, and then on the other hand, you also have this, um, in this case, in this picture, it's uh, indirect CD4s helping indirect CD8 positive cells or direct CD8s with semi-direct, actually here it's semi-direct, um, like I, I had for you in, the, in one of the first slides. So um, direct CD4, CD8 positive cells recognizing intact donor enriched um, okay, so then um, this was all talking about naive T cells and what's going on with memory T cells. Um, so why would people have never been transplanted have alloreactive memory T cells that can recognize donor um, MHC or donor polymorphisms? Um, one possibility, of course, is pregnancies um, because during delivery and perhaps during the third trimester, you can have some cells from the fetus that are encountered by the mom. Um, and that leads to activation of naive T cells against the MHC that's expressed by the male partner, by the, the father of the fetus, right? And uh, all those antigens. And so pregnancies and, and especially repeated pregnancies are going to lead to um, memory T cells that recognize um, the MHC from the partner that is expressing the fetus. Blood transfusions, um, you know, red blood cells don't have MHC molecules expressed in them because they don't have a, a nucleus. But uh, um, if there are some red blood cells that are contaminating, um, you can have sensitization as well. Of course, some people have previous transplants and then it's obvious how they can be sensitized. Um, and then there is this um, notion of heterologous immunity. I have uh, the next slide, I think, to illustrate this. Um, in that posits that infections that you encounter throughout your life activate T cells specific for the pathogens, but that some of these T cells uh, may cross react with donor MHC. Um, and of course, they would be activated and would be memory if you have encountered the, the pathogen. Um, you also have uh, memory that can develop after homeostatic proliferation um, in, in the cases where you have T cell depleting therapies. When the T cells come back and repopulate, um, they're exposed to a lot of homeostatic um, uh, cytokines such as IL-7, IL-15 um, that make them proliferate um, and can make them become memory-like. Um, and then, um, you know, there are some um, uh, data out there that show that mTOR inhibitors at low doses can promote um, T cell memory. Um, so um, here are some publications um, for you to have as well that <clears throat> suggest that um, memory cells are detrimental for transplantation. Here's a paper by Peter Heger. So naive T cells produce interleukin-2, but don't produce interferon gamma. Um, after they become activated by antigen-presenting cells, they differentiate and acquire the capacity to make interferon gamma, and then they quiesce, and memory cells can produce interferon gamma right away upon restimulation. And so in this paper, um, Peter Heger was looking at the precursor frequency of interferon gamma producing cells against donor antigens and was correlating that with the risk of post-transplant rejection, suggesting, so here it says, the severity of the rejection process may partially depend on the presence of environmentally primed T cells in the recipient that cross-react with donor antigens and have become interferon gamma positive. And so the pre-transplant frequency of donor-specific memory cells correlated with the post-transplant risk of developing acute rejection episodes. So this was you know, a bunch of, uh, of years ago. 
um, and this idea that the more T cells that were memory um, that you had, the, the worse the transplant outcome. So here are experimental data by Andrew Adams and Chris Larson uh, on, in mice, um, uh, demonstrating the, that indeed, if you are exposed to environmental pathogens, you can have um, immunity to those antigens and those T cells may by chance cross-react um, with some MHC molecules. So this is um, one figure from that paper uh, in which they infected mice with different viruses, LCMV, vaccinia virus, VSV. Um, and you can see that if the mice are infected, you can expand the number of T cells that make interferon gamma to that infection, but you can also stimulate them with donor antigen. And you can see that mice that were infected with LCMV compared to naive mice that had never seen LCMV um, have a, a population of T cells that can make interferon gamma in response to alloantigen. So there's some cross-reactivity between the population that recognizes LCMV and the population that recognizes alloantigen. And the same is true with um, uh, vaccinia virus, but not with VSV in this case. And if you look at the positive control, if you put a skin graft, this is like the maximum number of CD8 positive T cells that make interferon gamma that you can uh, generate in these animals. But so this is quite substantial. And um, uh, these memory cells were shown to um, prevent the induction of transplantation tolerance. So if you try and transplant and block co-stimulatory molecules to try and induce graft acceptance, if you infect mice with combinations of these viruses, now it's very difficult to induce transplantation tolerance and uh, usually it fails. So why are memory cells problematic after transplantation? And why are they a barrier to the acceptance of a graft or for the induction of tolerance? Um, and so this is going back to um, what uh, Gilles was mentioning at the beginning of the, of the lecture. Um, so it's not so much that they're higher in numbers um, because you know, they quiesce and, and the numbers that you're left with of memory cells is not that great. Um, but they seem to be less dependent on, on co-stimulation for um, activation. They may be resistant to other immunosuppressants as well. Um, so if you stimulate them with antigen in vitro, um, they don't depend as much uh, on CD28, although they still have some dependency, um, and they can depend on other co-stimulatory molecules, but there, there's really reduced dependence on co-stimulation. Now, this is what she was mentioning, that naive T cells absolutely have to be primed in secondary lymphoid organs, but memory cells can go straight to the transplant, uh, skipping the, this initial activation stage. <coughs> And then memory cells may also be resistant to suppression by regulatory cells. So here is a paper by um, Fadilakis's group showing the lack of dependence of memory cells on the secondary lymphoid organs. So this is looking at heart transplantation uh, in mice that are called Ali Ali. Uh, which have a mutation in an enzyme, NIC, that results in the absence of lymph nodes. And then in addition, they remove the spleen into these mice. So these mice don't have spleen, don't have lymph nodes. And if you transfer naive T cells into these mice, they cannot reject the heart transplant. However, if you transfer memory T cells that were activated in vitro first, um, they can go directly to the graft and cause rejection. Um, and then this is the other evidence that memory T cells seem to be more resistant to suppression by regulatory cells <coughs> in, uh, in this paper by Nick Jones. Um, and so this is uh, an adoptive transfer model uh, into RAG deficient mice um, in which an investigator transferred um, T cells um, that were 
um, specific or reactive to donor MHC class one or donor MHC class two. Um, and um, they tried to suppress them with regulatory cells. And so they showed that these regulatory cells were suppressing the ability of naive T cells to reject skin grafts. So if they co-transferred these graft reactive cells, conventional T cells in the presence of regulatory cells, there was a, a marked delay in graft rejection. But if they transferred um, memory cells um, and co-transfer regulatory cells with them, neither <clears throat> unprimed regulatory cells nor you know, antigen primed regulatory cells were able to suppress rejection. And uh, the kinetics of graft rejection, of skin graft rejection were similar whether they transfer T regs or not. Um, <clears throat> so these are different uh, reasons why memory can be problematic for the induction of transplantation tolerance. And um, there are many groups who are trying to um, um, inhibit these memory cells one way or another by um, blocking different co-signatory molecules that may be more expressed in memory T cells than in naive T cells or by targeting now transcription factors that may be uh, important for their function uh, and those kinds of things. And then finally, this is the, the last thing that um, Gilles was mentioning that perhaps when T cells go back in the graft, they don't need to recognize MHC class one or MHC class two, that perhaps they're recognizing some self peptides. Um, and there's definitely a role for epitope spreading, um, meaning that, you know, in the beginning, you probably need T cells that recognize donor MHC molecules, but then as uh, these T cells are damaging the graft, they're exposing epitopes that uh, are probably shared between the donor and the recipient um, and that are self and to which you know, T cells either may be tolerant or may not even be tolerant because they have never had to develop tolerance because those things are masked, like uh, you know, some um, hidden collagen epitopes um, or um, other matrix protein kind of, uh, of epitopes. Uh, and so it's this idea that the initiation of the allo response is triggered by recognition of alloantigen, but then the further graft damage may release these cryptic go to antigens, uh, and then the second phase of the, the rejection may actually be uh, similar to autoimmunity. And there's some evidence of that um, in uh, antibodies that one can detect after transplantation, people have been able to detect indeed antibodies against um, things that are um, structural uh, proteins expressed um, universally by both donor and recipient um, cells, uh, by mentin, myosin, collagen 5, tubulin, um, and so on. Um, you know, this may be more important for chronic rejection than uh, rapid acute rejection, but it could play a role in acute rejection as well. So uh, I think that's my, my last slide. So, you know, this was kind of an overview of how um, we're thinking about um, innate immune priming and poising, innate immune activation of T cells, and then direct, indirect, and direct T cells, naive T cells activating the secondary lymphoid organs, going into the graft, how can they recognize things? What cells can they attract? What innate cells may be um, participating in rejection at that time? Um, and then these um, different requirements for naive cells versus memory cells. Um, and then these different phases, perhaps, of autoimmunity and, and autoimmunity. So that's um, all that I have for you today, and I'm, I'm happy to take any other questions.